So um, once again, welcome everyone to Marymount Looks Forward. Uh, wonderful to see everyone here again. Um, hair a little longer, um, <laughs> except for Mr. Petrillo, who I think has fallen prey to the temptation for the strimmer. Um, it might become the uh, required look for English teachers in the school soon. Um, so after our bracing dash into the world of politics, courtesy of Speaker Gingrich last week, this week we can enjoy the consolations of literature, which alongside growing our hair has been one valuable thing that we've all had more time to do of late. As usual in Marymount Looks Forward, um, please do use the chat function to post any ideas or questions or other contributions you want to make um, during the discussion. Um, and this week, you're also invited to share examples of the reading that you've been enjoying recently um, and your thoughts on what the, these favourite passages of yours mean to you. To help us explore the world of letters and to consider its role in times of tribulation such as these, we are very lucky to have with us a world expert. Internationally renowned Joyce scholar John McCourt is currently Professor of English Literature at the University of Macchiarata. He has lived and worked in Italy for almost 30 years, originally following his hero James Joyce to Trieste to teach English. He's a regular contributor to international conferences and literary festivals and the author and editor of numerous books and articles on Joyce, Anthony Trollope and other writers with Irish and Italian connections. We're delighted and honoured that he is able to join us today to talk about turning to literature in this time of pandemic and looking forward by looking back. Over to you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matthew. And thank you also, Sarah, for this very kind invitation. I'm delighted to be with you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. I hate talking to a screen, but it's <laughs> been my lot, like everybody else, for the past uh, few months, in any case. Uh, delighted to be here. Yeah, as, as Matthew said, I teach literature. And um, I suppose when this pandemic was starting out, I was wondering about the value of what I was doing about the sense of trying to teach Shakespeare's sonnets or Joyce's Ulysses in the face of what Italy in particular was going through in, in March and, and April. Um, worse again, uh, the sense of trying to teach these great texts through, through a computer, through a, to a screen of non-responding students. At least today I can see all of your faces. Normally I have so many students, I just see their, their emails, which, which makes, doesn't make for great communication. Uh, so to try and make sense of things for myself, I think uh, early on I began to keep a diary, um, <clears throat> which proved, to, for me at least, uh, quite useful. Um, I began to do it initially to try and warn people in countries that were behind Italy on the, on the curve. Um, I published a piece of it in the Irish Times. I published 10 days in the Dublin Review of Books. And I published about another 50 days up, just up on Facebook. And it contained a mixture of things, daily life, the difficulties of teaching on the computer, um, the economics, the politics of the moment, the historical context. Uh, but increasingly, I found uh, literature creeping in and helping me to understand what we were living through and also to identify what was important from what was not. Um, literature is a means to help us uh, have some context, to live with a lot of uncertainty, and I think to provide um, a certain amount of consolation or solace. Um, I found that literature then was a means to appreciate the ordinary things that we so often took for granted, maybe still take for granted, and also a way to strangely reevaluate old-fashioned things like the virtues of patience and perseverance at this time and in all times. So I would suggest that we look to literature at a time like this, not to find answers, but to find questions or to find ways to frame questions. Literature is a series of question marks about he, we, how we as individuals, as families, as communities, as a society uh, might live. The concluding answers are up to the reader. Um, literature and culture guarantee absolutely nothing 
as we know. Some of the worst tyrants in the world were some of the world's best readers. The concluding answers in any case, as we try to read literature, are up to the reader. At best, literature can make us think and feel and laugh and cry, but mostly I hope it makes us think, or to learn to think critically and to question. And literature, I think, is an important antithesis to Twitter, which teaches us, as far as I can see, only to shout in a very short space of time or time of space. So we shouldn't expect, I think, to find literature that directly addresses coronavirus, but we can see how new, how old works, how great works of art renew themselves, unfold new meanings over time and in new and indeed unprecedented times like these. That, in a sense, I think, is why some literary works become classics, because they adapt or can be adapted to new challenges, new times. Thus, when I was reading Macbeth in March, I began to notice so much that was useful to this moment, such as the quotation when Malcolm talks to Macduff on the news of the death of his family and says, don't keep your grief hidden, put your sorrow into words. The grief you keep inside will whisper in your heart until it breaks. And as we all probably knew people who were directly affected by the deaths caused by coronavirus um, and the sorrow and the, the difficulties of finding a way to grieve with normal funerals uh, suspended. And I, I took part in a number of uh, online funerals in the last two months um, and saw people finding new ways to put sorrow into words. Um, on a very different note, um, perhaps closer to last week's talk, I also began to see similarities between Macbeth and uh, Donald Trump. Some people might say that um, that's an insult to Macbeth, who was a great tragic hero. Others might say it's an insult to Donald Trump, who didn't actually murder his wife. But both are good examples of vaulting ambition. Both have their cheerleaders, be it the Weird Sisters or the folks at Fox News. Quite apart from this, Malcolm in that play lists what he calls the king becoming graces, the king becoming graces of justice, verity, temperance, stableness, bounty, perseverance, mercy, lowliness, devotion, patience, courage, fortitude. One of Shakespeare's great themes is what makes a leader. What should the qualities of a leader be? And all of his leaders seem to be lacking in some of these virtues. And I think as we look around the world at our leaders, uh, there's no harm in evaluating them in the terms set out for us so many hundreds of years ago by Shakespeare. And uh, maybe look away from leaders who follow Macbeth's model, which is, for mine own good, all causes shall give way. Now, just what a writer should be doing in a time like this is, is not in any way clear to me. Um, I'm convinced we will be overwhelmed in the coming months and years with an excess of coronavirus fiction, love in time of coronavirus, uh, pandemic fiction. I'm not sure how valuable any of that will be. Most of it probably won't be. And I wonder what a writer should be doing right now. Perhaps W.B. Yeats was right when he was asked to write a poem, a war poem during World War I, and he wrote, I think it is better I think it better that in times like these, a poet's mouth be silent. For we have um, a poet's mouth be silent. For in truth, we have no gift to set a statesman right. He has had enough of meddling who can please a young girl in the indolence of her youth or an old man upon a winter's night. So the role of the poet, the role of the writer, is not to legislate, but perhaps to console. Perhaps uh, it's a more private um, role. No poet or playwright is going to bring down the Bolsonaro or any other leader, though they might help give us context in which to evaluate those who lead. In his elegy for W.B. Yeats, uh, uh, Auden famously asserted that, quote, poetry makes nothing happen. Poetry makes nothing happen. And another contemporary Irish poet, Paul Muldoon, in another poem, he imagined 
Auden's direct response as follows. And the his in the first line of verse eight. As for his crass rhetorical posturing, did that play of mine send out certain men, certain men, the English shot? The answer is certainly not. This was W.B. Yeats wondering if his play, Countess Kathleen, had caused Irish people to go out and fight for their freedom. Yeats somewhat wishfully writing himself into that narrative. Muldoon then adds his own take. He says, if Yeats had saved his pencil lead, would certain men have stayed at home? For history's a twisted root, with art its small translucent fruit, and never the other way round. In other words, art and literature doesn't actually make history happen, but it reflects history, perhaps, as it is happening. That said, there is, of course, and even at this particular historic moment, very often more truth in fiction or in poetry than there is to be found in fact and in the abundance of facts which we are overwhelmed with every day. So I suppose my sense right now is that the role of literature is, is to help us search for truth. It's a somewhat private search. It's to examine and understand our shared humanity, to attempt to reiterate what matters in the face of historical events that threaten to, write, to wipe away what is important. I believe science will get us through this COVID-19 quandary, but literature will help us live with it. Literature will help us live through it. And literature, like the virus itself, is something which does not respect borders. So we can borrow literatures from wherever we want. Uh, we're free to read whatever we want. I regularly come back to Joyce's Ulysses, which was written when what we like to refer to as normal life was suspended during World War I. Ulysses is many things, but among them it is a hymn to ordinariness, to acceptance, to the pedestrian rhythms of the everyday. It idealizes nothing but celebrates the unheroic, but also interrogates what we like to call the normal. It's also, of course, one of the significant texts of what we now call modernism and signaled a huge change in how we attempt to encapsulate life into a work of art, pushing the um, techniques that we had before it to their very limit. But in many ways, Ulysses is a one-off in the way that the Decameron is a one-off, in the way that the Divina Commedia is a one-off. And maybe this period will produce a one-off, a work that we will look back on and say that was, that, that was the work which spoke for those times for 2020. It's obviously way too early to say. And so in the meantime, I think all we can do is draw on what we have. And one of the poems that I liked reading over this period was, was the one by the Irish poet Derek Mahon. Um, because it both endorses and qualifies the andra tutto bene, the Italian mantra that many of us have been hearing uh, over the past months in Italy. Yes, in the overall scheme of things, tutto andrà bene, all will, all will be well. This is not the apocalypse, but it has brought suffering and hardship and death. It may also bring change, you know, for the better, but that will be largely up to ourselves and up to you and up to the next generation. There is little that worries me more about the insistence that we, uh, there's little that worries me more right now than the insistence that we need to get back to normal. As though normal where we had, whereas the normal that we had been used to was somehow okay. Because I think all of the limits of the normal and all the excesses of what was the normal have become and been made extremely evident to us um, in this crisis. So I think this crisis in a way will ask us to question the normal um, in, a, in a new way. In the meantime, I'm gonna read you a poem that I found significant. And in a strange coincidence this morning, I went down to get the post. Uh, I, had, I had mentioned this poem, Everything is Going to Be All Right, uh, in, in one of the diaries. And a friend of mine um, went out and sent me a, a signed copy of it this morning, which I'm holding up before you. Um, by, by Derek Mann. It's just one of a hundred copies of, of this poem. This was a nice surprise and it seemed to be an omen that I should read this poem. I wasn't sure what to, what to look to today uh, in, this, in this brief talk. Uh, the poem reiterates or iterates the importance again of the everyday, 
the autonomy of art, the fact that death is is very present in life, something I think that we know again now in a new way. As Beckett puts it in Waiting for Godot, we give life a stride of a grave, the light gleams an instant, then it's night once more. And we have been forced to contemplate the night um, and the shortness of life and the, the mortality in a way now that we, um, we were never expecting. The fact that our lives are, the shortness of our lives are made evident to, to us doesn't make them any less insignificant, actually quite the opposite. So this is a moment, I think above all else, which can help make us feel thankful uh, for what we have and push us towards preserving the deeply interconnected world in which we live. Uh, help us to realize, as Marcus Aurelius puts it, that that which isn't good for the hive isn't good for the bee. I mean, that is my hope, that we stop thinking and being busy bees buzzing for ourselves and start trying to do a little bit more for the collective. It's a poem that can provide hope, which is what literature can do also. What Thomas Hardy describes in his poem, The Dark Thrush, some blessed hope whereof he knew and I was unaware. And the, the, the delight with which hope can spring up sometimes and help us to embrace, I think, the reality of change. Because what we are in now, I think, is the beginning of a period of change as all of history has been. So I'm going to finish by reading Derek Mahan's poem. Everything is going to, to be all right, and then um, maybe I, we can have some, some discussion. Everything is going to be all right. How should I not be glad to contemplate the clouds clearing beyond the dormer window and a high tide reflected on the ceiling? There will be dying. There will be dying. But there is no need to go into that. The poems flow from the hand unbidden, and the hidden source is the watchful heart. The sun rises in spite of everything, and the far cities are beautiful and bright. I lie here in a riot of sunlight, watching the day break and the clouds flying. Everything is going to be all right. So it's not there.